This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. You make me feel like a natural woman. This is a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing, nothing without a woman or a girl. Ladies and gentlemen, what does it mean to be a woman or a man? Are these even inherently different or are these labels slapped on us by society dictating how we're expected to behave, how we should talk and walk, and how much we should earn? Dr. Sarai Aroni is a lecturer and researcher in the Gender Studies Program at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Her research deals with gender, feminism, and international relations with a focus on the effects of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, on the status of women, and the participation of Israeli women in peace talks, non-governmental organizations, and civil activity for peace. We are thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Sarai Aharoni to discuss women, men, and everything in between. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. Gladly. Um, So where do we start? I I went on to you on Twitter because uh, I don't know what what was the context, but somehow I I was exposed to a a piece you wrote, a research uh, you, you did about the involvement of American sailors, the influence of American sailors who came for decades here in the port of Haifa, I, I guess, and how they influenced uh, the local culture, economy, uh, maybe maybe more. So what's that about? Well, I was, um, I was really glad that you wrote me on Twitter because this piece of um, research that I did is actually one of the, my less known um, articles in English. In Israel, it did receive some attention. And, um, and it tells the story, a, a very important story, of Israel-US relations that is not part of the official narrative of um, you know, this, um, um, d- this deep and strong relationships between the two countries. And um, I followed the history of naval port visits, the U.S. Sixth Fleet. I don't know if you know, but the, the, Amer- the U.S. Navy is, is really divided into different fleets. And each fleet has um, a theater or a, a, a place of operations. And um, from, from, from 1973, basically, the Mediterranean um, has been part of or under the, the uh, presence of the Sixth Fleet. And um, the Sixth Fleet is part of NATO, right? The U.S. is part of NATO. And so the Sixth Fleet um, has this presence, had had a, a visible presence. And you had all these um, um, aircraft carriers, these huge boats with... Um, with Floating m- cities. Yeah, float, like. right. And um, with Marines and um, sailors and other personnel. And... Um, and these ships used to and still engage in what we call naval diplomacy. So naval diplomacy is, is, was a very important component in the Cold War, where the Russians, the Soviets, and also American Navy used to travel in different ports and kind of show the flag, right? They're showing physical presence, which is, and this is an empire. Can I tell you a short story about? Sure. So when I started to do this research, it was about local history. So the way ordinary people in Haifa remember these visitations. So I used to, for about... That's before Tinder. Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. It's really... these yeah. the, the visits officially started in 1979 after the signing of the Israel-Egypt peace accords. And they continued until 2001. So we're talking about... Um, like 20 more years where every year like around between about 30,000 American personnel, Navy personnel would come. 30,000? Yes. To Haifa port and spend between somewhere between four days to to two weeks. 30,000, it's like these are, now we're getting into metrics. 
thirty thousand uniques or thirty thousand like uh, visits? visits. So you know what I mean. Day, but visits, day, days of visit. Uh, we're um, well, thirty thousand days. We're talking about about. 250 days a year where you had some kind of an American military vessel in the Haifa uh-huh. port. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about this huge economy that developed over time around these visits. We're talking about formal economies like, um, you know, just um, um, a lot of um, food that was purchased for the for these um, boats, for the aircraft um, carriers. Bars, cafes. Yeah, that these is part of the carriers. informal. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> yeah. the informal, okay. The aircraft carriers, I think they carry, I read somewhere, around 4,000 yes. people. Yes, yeah, it could be 5,000 people. It's a city. 5,000, yeah. yeah, floating cities. Yeah. yeah. So I was talking to people, and some of them were very young, and one of the, the most... One of the kind of most impressive memories that someone shared with me was from, I think, um, probably 1980 or 1981. Uh, so not so long after these visits started, um, a, a person who he told me that he was young, he was maybe 11 or 12, and his father, he was a sailor. And his father was able to get him both of them to go on a tour on this uh, one of these aircraft carriers and he remembers very clearly the tour itself but he always also remembers that for him it was very clear that he was on um like a space cra- like a, on on he, he he it was just when star wars was kind of the original star wars movies mm. so for him I can't remember the name of the air, the, you know, the Star Wars. Um, X, the X ring or X. <laughs> no, the the hope. The okay, yeah. Ah, the movie the, or the aircraft. The aircraft in the movie. The yeah, the, the one know, that Harrison the X Ford. No, no, the X wing is just ah, a little one. The big the, one the, that uh, Harrison Ford drives. Yeah. Falcon, the, the Falcon, uh, I, the Falcon. Something. Yes. Okay, yeah. so it, it was very clear that this is an empire, right? And it's the empire, like the empire that we're seeing in the movies is mm-hmm. like the empire mm-hmm. that's coming to the city, right? So everything is connected. This is an imperial force that comes with this huge vessel to visit. And people loved Americans. They like loved the sailors and they welcomed them. And there was this early period of this euphoric thing. We So I went to the archives and I found these um, uh, brochures and uh, newspaper clips um, talking about the way the they had a band, so like, so there was a band, a naval band, and they performed in the city. So people came to hear the band, and they had these baseball matches between the baseball um, team in Kibbutz Usha with the baseball team on the aircraft carrier, right? So all these kind of cultural events and the sailors they used to walk with their uniforms, white uniforms, like beautiful uniforms and hats and they used to give these presents like zippo um lighters. zippo lighters and hats like caps and I, I i was able to trace some of these objects that remained um but then after a few years kind of a darker side um of these 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 visits developed this darker side because many of the this person, the, the personnel were... Only men, I guess. Yeah. Almost only men. Yeah, the majority of them were men. Um, and, you know, American, the American military is, 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 is really um, made of, of, it has changed over time, but it's, it's really kind of made of rough, kind of rough culture. It used to be more rough than nowadays. A lot of drinking and... Um, and sailors, um, marines, when they, they come to a port, they, they expect to have fun, right? So I was able to trace the gradual development of the informal economies. And actually, I was, I, I, tr- I was, I, I was very lucky to, to photograph the last bars in the downtown area that had um, traces of the visits with different stickers and um, like every every aircraft had a name and a sign and an emblem so they used to leave and leave 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 behind uh, photographs with signatures so I was able to take these pictures after that everything is gone because the downtown Haifa downtown has completely renewed yeah 
I yeah. think there's like one or two bars remain. Not even one. No, all of them. Are gone. Gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I really, I, and I did interviews with women who used to work uh, in the bars. And um, so I, so. What did uh, you, what did you find? Yeah, so I. these interviews? So I, I was able to find, um, so after, after this euphoric period, um, we found, find more and more uh, media coverage of, of um, violence, sexual violence against local women, um, different kinds of um, uh, different kinds of interactions that are seen as, as inappropriate. And this presence becomes like an annoyance, like loitering and noise and a lot of um, and then what I what I what I what I was interested in was seeing the way that the city was responding to, to these kind of challenges because you know US Israel relations are this very serious political issue right you can't just come to the Empire and say oh your soldiers are loitering <laughs> like this is really an interesting case of international relations what happens when mm-hmm. um, an Empire uh, you actually see the soldiers, and then there is uh, this very small town, like a very, very kind of middle class, nice town, that has to accommodate to this force of like military force. And we know this from other places, like in Japan, there are a lot of bases and like U.S. bases and in Japan, um, in Germany, in uh, Iceland, and other places. So these are challenges that have been documented in other places. And many people who do who do gender studies and feminist research have actually noticed these patterns that local women, um, um, which are, you know, sometimes invisible, local women are subjected to various forms of violence, sexual violence, rape, and other um, kinds of violence that um, are, are not visible because of the political interests, right? So that this like these women or others. Um, kind of pay the price in terms of their personal security and safety. I was able to find uh, one specific uh, case that was like a, brought to the courts of a, um, a rape case um, in in which it was really very hard to reach in a, to reach a, um, uh, like justice. And I think that's an important sign of, of you know how um, relations these relations developed over time. Um, but the but, but what what I also learned was how the world has changed, and uh, and um, after two thousand and one, well, you know, American uh, the American Navy has stopped visiting, and not all, and not only because of the official reasons there was an intifada, and then um, other things happened, but I think it's also something that has to do with the Mediterranean itself, and and, and I think that American like the American Mediterranean. Um, or the phase where the America was big in the Mediterranean is is changing, and I think the U.S. is really backed out and and has 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 really centered its forces in the Pacific. We're seeing the Pacific and the South China Sea and and the Gulf. Like the weight of their strategic right. presence changed. Uh, the scale shifted. Changed, shifted. Yeah. What What was the thesis of the of the piece, though? Like, if you can sum it up, like, what was kind of the conclusion and the thesis? So, um, I was looking into the way informal practices of containing violence developed in the shadow of these um, like formal politics. Because if you have this this uh, alliance, that an alliance between a, a very big empire and a client state, I I say then the, the small state, it's very hard for the small state to negotiate um, on issues of personal safety in ports. Mm. And so what kind of mechanisms with our, our informal mechanisms develop in such conditions? So I actually found that there were several of informal mechanisms, like, for example, framing, framing these visits as touristic, as a touristic venue. So... Many times the, the, the carriers used to come to the port and immediately they had buses waiting for them for like a two-day, three-day tour of the Holy Land. So they would immediately go to Jerusalem, to Masada, to Nazareth, to wherever. Just don't sit here and just drink in mm. our city, right? And that, would, would have been, that was really interesting, the way, it, the way 
like everybody was kind of satisfied, right? This was touristy. It was special. It's not really about rest and recreation. You know, these are this is not these are not bars and wherever. And another strategy was really creating this zone of bars that was very um, was really outside residential areas and like really really making sure that sailors don't interact too much with residents. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, is it available? This uh, study to on the internet. Yes, we can. I can. I, I think so. Send I, me a link, and yes. guys, if you're interested, just uh, go to the links and. Very interesting. So I want to I want to yeah. make a point though of the the because you you stated that that America was an empire and but it, I mean it's a it's an interesting use of words right like is it actually an empire or is it in more power. in the vein of of an empire like do you do you believe that that America really acts as an empire or do you think it just has the sort of presence of an empire. I think that um at the, the you know the historic that specific historic time from the late eighties to the early two thousands were very very um, important in u s history because of um, the the way the Cold War ended when the Cold War ended, it became clear that the u s is the superpower uh, a world superpower and and that was important um, important for um, global politics and I think the you know, the impact of the U.S. Um, at, at the later half 20th century, early half of the 21st century is clearly an imperial, uh, like this is an imperial footprint, whatever. Yeah. Because the empire for me has connotations of, you know, like controlling non-sovereign territories and the population there not have not having citizen status and like direct you know. control you're yeah think, you're thinking like the of roman the, empire yes. or, or the or, the, or england or the british empire yeah meaning control it you know the british empire was in india they they controlled that that country it wasn't a sovereign state that, why that go area. so far <laughs> they were they were in israel they were here yeah and and nobody in that territory has voting rights you know in the british empire or has well, the ability to democratic the u.s does influence. control guam and the, yeah so there are territories where you could yeah. say okay there are but they're but small they're they're like yeah relatively symbolic. to the empires that we know throughout history and you're not talking about those areas you're talking about the mediterranean yeah well empires is empire is a very interesting concept there are we have different there are different kinds of empires and um and and there are different kinds of control of resources and populations and uh, not e every empire is is uh, has direct or exercises direct power. For example, you know, even the British Empire had ruled, was able to rule through a series of um, companies, like economic companies, or um, um, you know, the the West Indies Company. That was um, an imperial um, force, but uh, it was not directly ruled, um, mm. directly ruled from Parliament or had. So, so I think um, different empires um, co empires come in different ways. And um, and I think America, uh, in terms of a like a cultural concept, there was um, in the the late eighties. Um, I think they had these um, events like America Week in the supermarket. Mm. They were bringing here. Uh, yes, they had these. Oh, we're guys. Bringing. We didn't have McDonald's <laughs> till I think uh, ninety one, and it was a huge event. Yes. Uh, when McDonald's came here, so, so, and and I think people don't realize that in the seventies, in the eighties, even in the nineties, people didn't travel much outside of Israel. So, when, like, it, they were like aliens. Yes. Like people, you know, they they never saw an American. Never, they've never seen, and they've never seen black Americans. That was something interesting that came up again and again, the fact that there were black Americans, the people were actually here. Yeah. Yeah. So are there kids in Haifa whose fathers were uh, sailors? Did you manage to find someone? Um, I actually, I heard, I got, um, I heard about abortions, you know, abortions in Israel are more accessible than in other places. 
and um but i also um i know of women who married um mm. who married ex um navy personnel that mm -hmm. they met as young women in haifa and left and live in the u.s ah, wow yeah just today we were in the u.s embassy <laughs> so we, uh, ah, yeah, you're trying we, to. I saw the, you know, we were right outside where all the Marines are, and yeah. uh, we we got a passport for our uh, our daughter that was just born. So we were. I had a little dosage of the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> this morning. Um, okay, let's segue to other areas of expertise of yours. Mainly, I think the most relevant discussion to be had is about Arab-Israeli women. Because uh, because the cases of violence against them uh, every month or two months this issue comes up. We just had uh, a gruesome murder uh, like two weeks ago. Mother and daughter. Mother and daughter in Lod, and um, and I think it's also the most relevant issue because we could discuss the the, the other like the territories of Gaza, but. But in the end, I think the the issue of uh, and and also when discussing peace and and I think that the main problem we have is within. So so I would would try and and ask you about that. So do, what do you think is how do you think Israeli Arab women perceive feminism, for example? Wow. Um, okay. So. I think there's a question of how do, what do we, how do we define the problem? What is the, what why, what is the problem here? And I want to suggest that we think of um, we take the word. There's a word that I think is useful, and the word is femicide. Okay, the word femicide is a very broad concept that describes a, a pattern or a phenomenon that happens in different places in the world, and that is that women um, are killed by intimate partners or by relatives or by people they know so this is a very very specific form of homicide right because women because if we think of you know crime regular crime or violence interpersonal violence we we usually find that most cases of homicide occur between certain strangers or you know groups or collective groups right but there so women have there's a specific pattern femicide the word femicide helps us to think about the, these killings as part of a pattern where women are targeted or killed by people who are very close to them, right? Family members, intimate partners, sons, fathers. So that is a very specific pattern. But in a sense, a lot of homicide is kind of characterized by within groups, right? Like if you think about it, like most homicide in the States happen within whether it's racial groups or within locales, or you know what I mean? Like usually the person, ki other than serial killers who like travel across the states and kill random people, a lot of homicide is happening because there's some kind of relationship, right? Well, no, I don't think that. I think that for women, it is specifically much more clear that the, mm. pa that you know, basically, when we look on it, you know, when we see the gender division of homicides in general, we know that men um, are m much more likely to die from violent, from a violent death. We're talking about like it could be eighty percent, like from homicides would be men killed by other men. And but but then when we when we zoom into only cases of female victims, we find that many of them have been killed by people who they are they know intimately, like very very close. And so that's a very specific pattern. Mm. But what I want to say is that there's another interesting and important thing that I, that I think we should take into account, and that is that in many places in the world, women who are indigenous or women who are poor or women who suffer from other forms of vulnerability are overrepresented in these femicide cases. So the, what's happening in Israel is actually something that we see in other parts of the world. So if we take statistics in Israel of femicide from the last um, you know, 20 years, we don't really have all the statistics, okay? That's another thing. But if we have, we, whatever we have, we take these statistics for the last 20 years, we see that um, Arab Israeli women who are 20% of the population 
are actually about 40% represented, like they're about 40% of femicides, which is double the percentage of in the, in the total society. And then you are right, right? You're saying, okay, so these women are more vulnerable. And um, and then the question is, okay, how long does the stats go? Because I I would guess that if you look just on the last three years, it would be even more than forty percent. No, no, forty percent. Okay. Yes, yes. But I'm you know I'm an historian. You've already noticed okay. I have this long memory. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I cut you. Yeah, yeah. But I am you know I I I always prefer thinking about long durees. Okay. I think long durée is is better. Okay. Always to to understand where we are now. Mm-hmm. We need to think um, before we were born a little bit, right? So think about the, your time, your lifespan, and take a few years before and think of that as something you can manage. Um, so we have, uh, so Israel, you know, in 1991, Israel basically um, has the first law that prohibits domestic violence, the anti-domestic violence law. It means that before 1991, it was not illegal to, For a man to beat his wife, it was not illegal. Did you have general laws against violence, yeah, in general? Yeah, but it was like domestic violence was not criminalized until nineteen ninety one meaning a woman couldn't come and say I was assaulted by my husband, and then the husband could be tried right. in the court of law that yeah, that was so, impossible. No, it was people you know the police would say, you know this it's like a family argument, you know it happens. It's not really nice. Maybe you should try, you know, you should try and talk find to a him because there's yeah. a difference between like what what happened in law and what happened in reality. So I'm wondering if there there were no cases of domestic violence before ninety um, one. So the first data we have, um, well, some, somewhere between 1966 to 1976, uh, women's organizations start collecting um, information about women who come to the legal, come to their voluntary legal advising centers talking about domestic violence, but nothing is published. In 1976, the, first, the Knesset has a first debate about domestic violence, which is dismissed by the majority of the Knesset members who are, who are men. But that was also the first time the police comes with some kind of data. And then in 1978, with the first report submitted to the government about the status of women, these, this is a lot of information, I know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's when we actually have first numbers, 1978. And so it takes about, I think, 15 years between the first debate in the Knesset until there is a law. Mm. Okay. I don't know if that's a, law, a long time or short time. This is what we call feminist time. I can never know like, whether it's fast or, yeah. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Future generations but, but will there, decide. But that, that has to do with cases of like, data about the number of... Of cases of domestic violence yeah cases as in like instances but I'm wondering about like legal cases like were there any instances of a woman bringing the, her husband to court very few because the law oh. there was the, the legal there were no you know the law was not was not suited was not for that yeah the, the law didn't give women the you know the, the language to pursue justice and And then the law starts to change and also last. I guess culturally like you know when my mother was uh, a child uh, if, uh, or like uh, I don't know in the 60s a uh, father would uh, give a slap to his his like it was yeah, it was like, just uh, like how child, it was yeah all, you know also 19 I think until 1987 I think beating of children was yeah was not prohibited it was yeah. very customary to you know. Yeah. Um, there is this Hebrew saying, um, right? A person who does not hit his child hates him. <laughs> so, like, it's a good thing. Shivto mm-hmm. uh, is a rod, right? It's yes. It's like a, with a stick. Right, a stick. Yeah. Um, okay, so how does it bring us to present days then? So um, after the, the, you know, the domestic, the anti- um, domestic violence laws are put into place and they're gradually um, um, a system of uh, shelters is built at initially by feminists and then by the state um, 
more and more information is out there about patterns of femicide. And then we also start having these the numbers. So um, Arab women um, and uh, Jewish women are, are basically, we see the statistics, the death statistics. Um, we see them, um, we have them from the early 90s. And one of the things that changes is, I think, um, kind of the ways that women are killed. Um, Jewish women in the, ni- in the 90s, um, many Jewish women were murdered, who were killed by partners, were murdered with um, guns. And then there was a reform in gun laws. Mm. And the military also had a huge reform about uh, using guns. And the number of Jewish women that were killed using weapons like um, arms has really declined. Mm -hmm. And the number of uh, Arab women that were killed using by uh, arms has really increased Mm. throughout the years. So it's not only, you know, the numbers, it's really how these women are killed. And uh, this really, I think, um, hints that there's a, we think, I think that there is a connection between the killing of women with rising insecurity, crime, um, and um, the general insecurity of, of Arab um, women in certain places, in Ramle and Lod, in Jaffa. So in many Arab cities, I think. In many Arab cities. No, uh, no. There are certain, this is, for example, in the Golan Heights, mm. you have a very big Druze community. Yes. And for some reason, um, women from these communities are not murdered at all. Mm-hmm. So when we look at these as... When but they I, come from... A different culture. A different culture, right? No, no. Because they were Syrian are, Druze. Yeah, right. But what I'm saying... No, but... For, right. But what I'm saying is that we, when we zoom into these cases, we can actually see patterns we can see that certain neighborhoods or certain villages or certain cities are more dangerous for women. And what, why is that? And then we ask, why is that, right? And then we say, okay, so certain places have less, have more, for example, crime, more arms, um, and these places um, are, have lower, in terms of the economic situation, or education, or access to education. So we're seeing that it's very, very, it's, it's really, we cannot just blame culture. We cannot blame um, religion. There are many other factors involved. And, um, and, and we know that, you know, Arab Israeli women um, have less opportunities and less infrastructures. And they are kind of behind in terms of you know when they actually get education and entering the workforce. So we're, we, although you know, the trend is is, but yeah. but I wonder if you compare, because I'm sure you can isolate these factors. Again, it's it's sociology, so it's it's not like an exact science. But I wonder if you. I mean, I'm sh- I'm sure there are places in Israel where the isolated variable is culture. And you have, I don't know, like Ofakim, or if you take some neighborhoods of Batyam, I'm sure you can find something where there's high levels of crime and low socioeconomic and lower education levels and compare the two. Well, you don't think you'd find any difference? No, we, we, there, there's, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of, there's a, there, there's a growing, we have growing knowledge about different ways to try and identify trends. So, for example, uh, recently, there is um, um, an, um, uh, there's uh, on on the way. There's a national. There's going to be a national survey of violence, domestic, of intimate partner violence in Israel, and they are working with. Uh, there's an, a very interesting group that's uh, working together with the government and civil society and others to try and create a questionnaire, a national questionnaire, and um, they did this pilot. And what one of the things they found was that. Israeli um, upper class or middle upper class Ashkenazis, like secular, would be less likely to report and come to authorities, would be police or welfare, and report domestic violence. 
Mm-hmm. Which means that... We don't know. Someone has to do a targeted campaign targeting middle upper class Ashkenazi Jewish women telling them that it is, you know, maybe if you're experiencing something, you can report. Mm-hmm. But this is not about culture. These are, um, this is much more complicated. Than, you know, culture is a word that people use, but I think it's, it's um, it, we, can, we can explain many of these things in, in using different um, factors, like more the word culture. I don't, I don't think the word culture works good. But why? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Because well, I love the word culture. The, the reason... The <laughs> I feel reason, like everything is downstream of culture. Uh, yeah, because the thing is, it, it's complicated. It's a really complicated topic. But to me, it seems that Arab room, like if you look just in, in our neighborhood, like look at, like in places like Gaza, in places like Ramallah, Okay, the feminism, I don't know if it is even exists in some of those places, right? Uh, But you don't you know? know because, wait, You're, you have many assumptions about <clears throat> what's happening in Ramallah, right? There's an assumption. There is this implicit assumption. But, you know, as a scholar, I would... I would say, but what is this assumption based on? Have you visited Ramallah and... No. Okay, so no, but it's... It, but there are certain... There are, there are f like, facts in the that the assumption is based on, which is, the you know, the mother and daughter that were murdered. Yeah, but that is an incident. No, facts. But if we look at the... the She talks about statistics. The, no, about I'm saying that yeah. that's a statistic. Those are two women that were murdered, and plus another two, and another two, and another two. And you look at the statistics over the year, and 20 women, 20 Arab women were murdered, and I don't know, one or two or three Jewish women... Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you look at that, and I know you, we want to look at a... No, it's not. These are not the right statistics. We're talking about 40%, 40% from the women who were from femicides per year would be of Arab women, which means that the But other you're talking about a period of... No, each year. So 60%. You're talking about but the average over a yeah, period the average of 30 would years. Be, yeah, so for example, the 60% are not Arab women. Yeah, but I'm saying the average over 30 years, I wonder... <clears throat> how much of that is also attributed to the lack of statistics, lack of da data, meaning I assume that in the 80s, there wasn't a lot of data about Arab women being murdered in Arab communities because right. it was their problem. Yeah. And so no one reported it to the police. The police didn't care. There were no data points, although Jewish women were recorded. Now we look at the data. There's never an Arab woman who's, or hardly an Arab woman who's murdered today And it doesn't reach the headlines. And we look at the last couple of years, and you see dozens of Arab women killed a year and single digits of... No, it's not. We have 60% of the women... In who, the last years. Yeah, and women I, who are not said, Arab. I think said 40% to 60% is over the last 30 years. In, no, on every average. year. Like, on average, every year. On average. Yes, every But average year. means you take all the numbers and you average them out. Meaning one year in might be higher. In the last three years, was it also yes, or yes, the last two is, years? Yes, was also about, 40%? percent. Yeah, because majority of the women who live in Israel are Jewish, right? So the majority yes. of the women who die by intimate partners or whatever but, but are, I women, find that are hard Jewish to women. That, I find that hard to believe that the average matches the exact numbers per year, meaning it was... What I'm saying is that, what I'm, what I'm saying is that there is this... Okay, I'm It's I'm fascinated. I'm times fasc two. No, I am fascinated by the way that Jewish Israelis are so interested by, you know, the femicide or the killings of Arab women by Arab men. And while the truth is that Jewish women are also killed by Jewish men, right? So but this and this pattern we also find it in many other places, that um, minority women or racialized women or black women or indigenous women who really die more in terms of their relative percentage in the population all over the world are always perceived through this prism of being victims, right? These, like, the idea of victims, these are the ultimate victims 
victims of their culture or victims of their partners or victims of, you know, whatever it is. That is also a very, very interesting cultural, I don't think it's cultural, but I think it's political. I think it's a way of not really talking of other things, like, for example, discrimination, like systematic discrimination, or the question of resources, society, the way society actually balances resources between communities. Certain things, you know, there are certain things that people don't know. Uh, I come, you know, I, I work at Ben Gurion University in the Negev. And in the Negev, we have uh, communities um, of Bedouin, Bedouin communities that live very far away from um, health services. And um, young Bedouin women, some of them, they don't have access to any kind of um, like pregnancy services. So they don't. When so, for example, when they become pregnant, they sometimes they don't see a doctor, and they would arrive. They arrive to Soroka Hospital without having even one checked one time by a doctor and so some of these young women uh sometimes they have these babies that you know they die at birth or the babies are very very damaged and like nobody knew that like these women were not they did not see a doctor throughout their pregnancies and for me like this is it's like state violence like what's the problem why can't israel have this car like a a, a medical um, you know, there are these um, medical vans that you can just drive through villages and have women tested or have women get basic services, maternal services. And that's, nobody's doing that, right? But those women are, okay, th- let's let's break down this example, I, th- I think. Um, for people who don't know, uh, in the Negev, you have huge populations of Bedouins. Indigenous populations. Uh it depends because Bedouins by nature were were moving around, right? So the those Bedouins uh, are indigenous to the region. They're indigenous to, to in the Middle region. East because yes. because what happened, but historically, is that when the like Bedouins came through Israel or Palestine for for mm-hmm. centuries, and so it happens that when they formed the borders in forty eight, those specific ones were happened to be in those specific places. But right. like many nomadic, we have different nomadic communities right. like Sami in the northern. Right. Right, but yeah, those are the most famous, I think. What Bedouins? And, yeah, I, I think, and 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 maybe the biggest. Uh, no, Sami in the north are, but we just okay. don't live in the Scandinavian, yeah. so I guess we don't. We're not. Um, <laughs> ah, he, I, you mean famous in Israel? In Israel, she's talking about it in the yeah, not like in the, the we world. We have various nomadic communities that yeah, yeah. have the same head, yeah, the yeah, same yeah, fate, no. right? When you said we like have, I thought Israel has. Ah, okay. um, so uh, and and they li- they live and 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 this becomes a huge uh, huge problem because they live in certain terri- in certain areas they claim it's theirs there's a legal dispute whether it's theirs and in the meantime they uh, choose many of them choose to stay there live in sub in, in subhuman um yeah, but there's the question of conditions. indigenous communities. No, I'm communities just trying to explain how it looks like there oh, because yeah. many our audience in the states maybe they don't know like so they live in 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 actual like how can you describe how they live? Squalor. They live in yeah, they live in, in tin huts. Yeah, like, no running water, no electricity, and throughout the years, I think it's to be fair, we need to to mention this. The state tried to the state came to many of them and told them let's move you to a city with yeah. and you will get a piece of land for free you can build a home there and live like normal people right. um, but you will need to give up your claims basically right. yeah. and many refused right. most so, of them refused and and people who listen to us who come from north america would know that these tensions with indigenous communities and the question of land and the question of property and territories is very similar to that of Native Americans, Native Canadians, you know, th- First Nations. These are um, debates that are happening all over the world. You know, what are the rights of indigenous populations? This is not only happening in the Negev. Um, it, it hap- it's happening in Canada. It's happening in in uh, in the U.S. and 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 these are these are very hard questions of uh, you know what are the obligations of the state towards these communities and for this is so the question of for example maternal maternity um, birth um, uh, death rates or women who die during birth giving birth 
So in Israel, these numbers are quite low, much lower than the U.S. And the, U- the U.S. maternal death rates like mater- are, are, are quite high, very high. And that is because there is no, um, well, well, you know, health system is just not available as it is in Israel. So that's really why we have so lower uh, maternal birth ra- um, death rates in Israel, because of that we have a good health system, and that really benefits many women. And those what Bedouin are the women, difference, like what? How big of a difference is it? Is it a big difference? Wow, it's huge. Israel, the maternal uh, death rates in Israel, I think, are like four or five per one hundred thousand births. Hmm. And in the U.S., it would be about forty or forty-five. Ten wow. x. Yeah. But the oh. Bedouins uh, you mentioned, the Bedouin women, first of all, just to explain. And wait, uh, I just want to say yeah. that f- these number there is an over-representation of Bedouin women mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in these statistics. So if we were able to reach um, these young Bedouin women who are pregnant and give them appropriate services like other women in the country, then it, it would be even lower. But when you say, uh, it bothers me when you say they don't have access to because they are Israeli citizens. Right, they Just, can go to... They have, probably they have, because it's obligatory, also in the early 90s, they legislated this law where everyone is has to be at one of the kupot cholim, one of the... Well, healthcare providers. Healthcare providers. So I guess all of them are members, um, or at least they can very easily become members. And so if they came with their membership to Rahat, uh, the biggest yeah, Bedouin city... Yeah, so you say city, technically, why can't they just no. go to see a doctor? No, I'm yeah. saying they have access. Right, yeah. so why won't they go, right? No, that's what you're because asking. what you're suggesting is that the state accommodate their lifestyle. No, I suggest that if there is a specific area where women don't come to, where they don't have, they actually don't have access to maternal, like the appropriate. So then there are these possibilities that we know that for example there is a um, um, a moving vehicle we we have we have those the, the state actually have has those um, that can scan and this is used in the world to to treat women in very peripheral areas so this is really this is possible and it's not so costly right so but but it's it's more about seeing these women that's what i'm seeing i'm seeing is that the reason that these women are dealing with certain issues of like, for example, health, is really because they are part of a minority that is not being seen, right? This is something that has to do with the status of Arab women in this state. But that's where I disagree. And I think that the reason that they're in that position is because their culture is backwards. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, but I, in Bedouin, no, seriously, it's easy. wait, hold on. They, I, I they, think that the reason that they're in that situation is because Bedouin culture uh, oppresses women, is violent. They can marry towards five women. women at once. They marry five women. They yeah, they they, they, know, they murder they murder yeah, and, and are is, violent towards the women. So there is there is a culture of violence and of oppression towards women that has been that has been which i think also providing these services would is sort of an enabler in any way but that but even if we can agree that providing the service would would help these women i think the first cause causality is the fact is culture and then comes okay maybe the state could help and it doesn't help so there's problems here and we could we could fix that but the first the 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 major contributing factor is their culture and their education that they that they proliferate through generation through generation by educating their kids in this way and and, and maintaining it. The women there are a tool to make children and and get social security. You're just kidding me, right? <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're, this is you're not. You're, are you really? Do you really think we're this? not in the academia? I do, but, but, but convince me otherwise. You, ste- you stepped out of the of the tower, how the no, ivory just, tower. Because, you know, it's like your dialogue now is really the things that we teach in class. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! You can hear. You can have your students listen. Yeah. To yeah. There's these idiots outside, <laughs> and this is what they think. And now no, you're meeting them. For a, the first no, what you are okay. So there is this concept of a social script. And social, social or cultural scripts, that is the way to, we use the word culture, for example, in a more appropriate way. So what is a cultural script? A cultural script is, is like um, the right way to think about a problem. 
And so we, we, we hear these scripts from various places and we, we you know, identify with them, believe them, re repeat them in different places. So what you are now, both of you were uh, presenting a very, very deep uh, cultural script that is very hegemonic within the Israeli Jewish society. So Israeli Jews tend to think about um, Arabs as backward. And it's a cultural, well, I'm, I'm just describing the cultural script. They tend to think that Arabs are backward. They tend to think that the reason that they are backward is because of their culture. They tend to connect this axiom of like, backwardness and culture with um, the status of women, right? So they tend to see that this is connected. And they also connect this to this violent masculinity of Arab men. Now, okay, this is the this is like the box. It's, it's a box. It's, a, it's like you open the box and hip, the script comes out. <laughs> and then people just talk about this as if Just say we're cliches. It's no, <laughs> it's not a cliche. It's but, uh, a, yeah, it's okay. a cultural script. Could it be that there's a cultural script that says that that the reason Arab women are have a higher uh, death birth death rate is because of the state violence that doesn't? Yes. I mean, could it be that the the yes. the the, the so if thought, you, if the, you, the ideas that you're representing are from from your research or a cultural script? Yes, yes, you can, you can, if you, if you, for example, go and do uh, research, if you're an ethnographer, you, you study culture and you go and you try to understand the way uh, Arab society or communities talk about violence, right? So how would they talk about it, right? What is their cultural script about the same issue? Then you would also find <laughs> a cultural script, right? No, so, but I'm wondering if there's a cultural script in academia. Maybe of there course. is a cultural script yes. in universities, that the course. way they talk about. Yes, it yeah. is. So so everything can be a cultural script. Yes. Basically. Now, the question is, okay. okay, so when you use these concepts, which are analytic, right? This is an analytical concept. You say, okay, so how do we work with these concepts? Um, and then, well, these are, are serious debates about you know, whether there is truth. What can we know? What is it? Like, how do we, act, how, what is, how can we empirically try to trace certain, certain, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, me as a feminist scholar, this is really very, this is a challenge because Israel is a, is a, you know, there is on the one hand, Israel is a democracy and there is this sense of this is, you know, based with the ideas of gender equality and we have women in the IDF and we have women working in the high tech sector and we have uh, women in the Knesset in numbers that are growing, right? And we have all these, like, we can we can say, look, we've done a lot. There's something here that's really an indication of gender. I mean, I've done nothing, but, like, yeah. <laughs> society, Israeli society has done a lot. Yeah. We can take credit for it, though. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> this is, this is, like, Not it's so like, much. Uh, there's this cake, and then there's yeah. layer on the cake. There's a certain layer that says, look, this is what. Things are good. Uh, yeah, better. Better. <laughs> right? But like we but all is it want... not accurate? Is it Right. And then uh and then, you know, you have these um instances where you actually um have other kinds of statistics, right? Certain like for example, when we look at um sexual violence. So for example, statistics and reports on sexual violence are very bad. Um, not only in Israel, in other places as well, but that is a serious issue, right? So we have to say, okay, this is an issue. Um, and also, um, young women, many young women, you know, I have students and uh, we have many, and they are angry, like many of them are just angry. <laughs> and they feel that they live in this macho, very kind of macho um, society, and they, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that women, I have students who come here from, I have, I just had a PhD student from Sweden. She spent half a year in, in, in Israel. She's super cool and nice and everything. But yesterday we had a meeting and she's going back and she said, I just need some quiet. I just want to be able to walk um, in a street without being harassed. So for her being in Israel for five months was 
this constant experience of being harassed all the time. Mm-hmm. And we as Israelis, we sometimes, we just don't notice this. <laughs> we don't. Yeah. We are, we like, we get used to living in this very tense, intense, violent, like, macho community, society, public space, or sometimes even, you know, private spaces. Or, and it's very hard to acknowledge that, you know, this is really tough. And these are paradoxes that happen. You know, you have on the one hand, we see all these beautiful high-tech buildings here in Tel Aviv and like we're in we're in this this in like a semi-western democratic society but then at the same time no this is really not a very safe place for women to it's one of the safest places for women in the world though among all the places in the world women live it's definitely in the top 30 or 20 well I I would no? I really think that we should we should one of the one of the um, and for men by the way too yeah i don't i don't know i i i no it's not true it's there is a problem of of um that's a problem of how to conceptualize security what is security and um when when my students or if they say i don't feel safe and I tell them, no, but look, statistically, <laughs> like if you were to live now in another place, you would, like, or statistically, you are less likely to die um, by, um, uh, you know, a, an intimate partner, or statistically, you are less likely to be raped by a stranger, or statistically, you are less likely to get, um, um, you know, Assaulted. AIDS or whatever. Yeah. Like, I, I think that's a fair measure. No, like, if I'm it, like killed, the, raped or assaulted. So my students would look at me devastated, saying, no, this is not the way we want to measure our safety. But then you should, you should wait, wait, connect this them is a, with a, a subjective, Somalian uh, no, woman. And no, no. I'm not sub- saying that we can't get better. I'm just saying that objectively, relatively. Subje- I think listening to women when they say our subjective experience is, you know, whatever, we our subjective experiences of being all the time harassed, that is a very important thing that they're saying. They want a different world. And I respect that. They want a different but world. But it's anecdotal, and then I can tell you an anecdote. I, 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 no, but I, I want to I agree with you for a second, because I feel like we haven't done enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do agree that we can do better. Um, we should and that, strive, you know, as a father to a daughter, um, a f- new new father to a daughter, and a husband to a wife that I both of them I adore very much. I want to envision a world in which they don't have to walk around fearing anything. Uh, so I absolutely agree that we should strive to have a world in which women can walk around safely and can look up to men as as people who will m- to Not look who, up. No, look, 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 look to look up. Sorry, I meant look up, and because in the end, why are women subjugated to violence? Because men are, and we kind of touched on this in our because of the d- differences between gender. Men are physically, on the whole, statistically more physically powerful, and then they use that power. Bad men use that power to overpower women and take advantage of women, and I think that's an awful thing. That's what I meant to look. And so I, I want to envision a world in which w- m- the women in the world can look to men to, to serve as a protectors and not as or offenders. Or as partners. Partners, partners as yeah. well, but, but of course as partners. But I'm saying on the physical violence level as protectors, meaning people who are willing to protect them against other men that, are, that, that strive to do harm and bad things to them. So I absolutely agree with that. But I think where we differ is that I believe that that not seeing the difference between Bedouin culture and Arab culture on a whole in Israel and, and around the world does takes us in the wrong direction and Western culture has taken us over history in the right direction. And that's where I think we're making a mistake is that I believe that it's Judeo-Christian Western values that have carried us to the place where we are today Whereas, and, and not recognizing that dissonance and that difference is but do, doing us do harm. But do you really believe that? I do. Really? I do. Maybe I'm an idiot, but I do. Well, you know, 
it's just a belief. <laughs> <laughs> it's a <laughs> cultural <laughs> script. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's just, it's just, it's a very, very powerful myth. But, it's, but it's, that's what it is. But, so, but, it's but a, maybe it's I want to understand yeah, why. Yeah, it is a powerful myth. Okay, I want to say that, um, um, I, I want to say that, uh, you know, I self-identify as Mizrahi. I am Mizrahi. What, what does this mean? It means that my family comes from the Middle East, right? It means that my ancestors have lived in the Middle East for forever. <laughs> and it means that I am also indigenous and I'm part of this region and I'm part of this culture. And the reason that I don't speak Arabic the way my father speaks Arabic is just because, um, you know, I was born in a time and place where it was really, really um, inappropriate to teach children, Jewish kids, to speak Arabic, despite the fact that this wasn't the language of my, you know, my 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 ancestors. That's true for almost all Aliyah, all of, all of the Aliyah. in Israel, right? In Israel. So I think From all countries, right? But I think that for me, as a person who is part of this region, the fact that I did not have a chance to continue my own culture just because I'm Jewish <laughs> is something that is very, very harmful in my in the way I see myself. And I feel that I was kind of robbed from a part of my identity by people who see themselves as very, very, you know, Western, enlightened, progressive. Um, and this is... Um, I think a good starting point to understand um, the limitations of enlightenment, right? So, so there are these limitations, and we live in this region where we need to have m more complex explanations and understandings of what is it that we're doing here, what kind of culture is it that we're engaging with, and 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 you know, Israel is is, I think the the one of the good things about Israel is that. It's like an experiment, right? This is a huge social experiment with bringing people from different places in the Middle East, positioning them in a place that has always been historically multicultural. This region was multicultural. And, um, and so how do we figure out, we, I, I mean people in our, like our generations, like we need to kind of create the future for others. And how do we figure this out? Do we stick with these kind of, dividing perceptions of Western, non-Western, Arab, or whatever? Or do we find other ways to talk about these things? Now, I but don't, don't you need shared values to talk? Like, if I can't... We have many shared values. I live in, you know, I live in Haifa. Mm -hmm. Okay, Haifa is a very mixed city, and, there, and, and, I, and I really believe and think that, uh, you know, people I know and work with or meet or whatever, we do have a lot of shared values. I really think that shared that we have more shared values um, in this country than we think. But when I hear about a family where the father in, in Lod uh, kill, like we hear a lot about uh, murders, for yes, example, that is because, hard. Wait, f because, because the woman divorced or because the, the sister went out with someone I don't know or because so I, I say to myself I have nothing in common with yes, those but, people yes, but, and, and but so you but it's I, I it's hard for me to tell you to, to explain but um, we the thing okay but you know what I'm saying though right like, no but I, I I'm what I want to I want to tell you something even worse okay something <laughs> even worse more depressing okay maybe in the house that you live in this neighborhood um, in an apartment next to you, there is a father that um, is sexually violent towards his daughter. Maybe. Right? Yes. But you don't know it. But what I'm saying is, no, what I'm saying is that violence, right? Violence is something that is very, very hard to conceptualize. And um, it is really hard to learn that people are violent. And so we try to find all these excuses to explain these, these things. Why would a person kill his wife? Why would someone hurt his child? Why do you think? Well, I think that um, there, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a realist feminist. And I, and I think that um, 
um, we need to acknowledge that people, um, that people have, that, you know, the, hum- the human beings could be really cruel and, and bad. And it's, it's, and we, we try to find other explanations, but, but human beings could be cruel and bad. And I think that we, that this is something that, um, that we can, we need to acknowledge to try and change things. We th- we can we can we can take this and say, look, this is um, um, we need to we need to find ways to minimize. It could be also. But how do you minimize? Like I mean, yeah, not education, how do you minimize, but I, I guess, education. I guess what causes people? What causes people to be cruel? As yeah. you define it, right? Yeah. Like so what? I think it could be anger. It could be so. It could be poverty. It could be lack of education. It could be just neglect. It could but be education starts at home when you're zero years old, and that's where culture what comes that, in. Wait, what, what does that mean? Lack of education, or lack of access to education? Like because I didn't learn like biology and math and literature, then I. Or I'm not trying to. Formal. I'm just trying to understand. No, I what, mean like what, formal, what, lack of formal education. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. What do I learn in school? I learn um, how to do math. I learn maybe uh, in Israel, you it kind of moves over a little bit more into the value arena with like the citizenship, right? Israelchut um, and stuff like that. But like, I mean, because I learn, like, I'm trying to understand what part of education would cause me. To me, it's the education at home. Like my mother is a kindergarten. Like she has a. She's a kindergarten teacher for my entire life, and she works with the ages three months to two years. So that's actually like when you see her work with those kids, um, it, there's a lot of education going on on those two first years about uh, interhuman relations and violence. Yeah. And she teaches them, at, it's amazing to see, do not, she tells like she can tell a, th- a six month year old baby, do not. Hit this, your friend. So to me, that's education. Now, and that's cultural because when you come from a home that doesn't give a shit about the children because you have thirty children, okay, you're less likely to to bother and educate them. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, but it's also a question of what values you're educating. Them. Also, yes, yes, please. Sorry. Yeah. Well, education is also about formal education. So what is formal formal education? For example, the numbers of years that a person went to school, right? It will be formal. So six years of schooling, nine years of schooling, 12 years of schooling versus 20 years of schooling or education, higher education, high, high degree. Education is a very important factor when we try to analyze certain, like for example, income. We know that education is highly correlated with income in a person's older life. So if you take a child and you say, okay, this child, his or her's income will be connected to the years of schooling. You don't know anything about this child, nothing. You don't know the color of their skin, you don't know her gender, you don't know where was she born, nothing. But the only thing you might know is that the number of years of schooling might make her or his income higher which is a very strong factor. So edu- so if we think of education this way as an asset, of like, um, and we also know that higher income is related and correlated with more safety or more personal safety, uh, with a better chances to be healthy, right, uh, et cetera. So we know that if we invest in, ed- in formal education, years of education, and we get kids into school, schooling, it's so like this is a very technical way of looking at things, but it is actually very efficient. So when I speak about education, I kind of speak of that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But but do you think and and you think that contributes to what might cause someone to be violent? For example, could be yeah because it's connected with other factors. So like we we can think through these problems in different ways. We we can. If you asked my mother, she would say that when the kid gets to first grade, it's already too late. Like 80% is already said and done. Uh, I, I would say, I think that there's two main <laughs> factors that would cause someone to be violent. And I think one is a lack of control. Either I cannot control my emotions or my values uh, promote violence, meaning uh, dictate to me that the violence is the right course of action right now. For example, I, I would... I. I would never 
lay my hand on a woman, right? And that's because I have learned to control my emotions and my values do not tell me to lay a hand on a woman. On the other hand, I could be violent. I, I could kill a woman if she was holding a gun and she was pointing at me and I and she was threatening to shoot me. Okay. That my values like tells me self-defense, right? I could be extremely violent if I was serving in the military of my country and I was fighting a war and I had to bash, I don't know, someone's head in with a hammer. I would, I would ho- I, I hope I could find this, the wherewithal and the strength to do it, even though it's a horrific act because that my values tell me that right now this is the thing to do. This is the enemy. I'm fighting for my country to protect my home. This is, and it's a horrific violent act that I would never do. In, but it's because of my values push me to there. To, to let loose and not to control my violence and to, to so I think those are the two things that really cause someone to be violent either they they d- haven't been educated to control their emotions and two-year-olds are are literally the most violent people on the face of the earth luckily they're small and controllable but like but they're the most violent people and if you don't educate them to control their violence then they'll they'll end up becoming horrific adults or if you educate them that it's okay to hit a girl because you're a man and you should show her who's who's boss um and if she dares threaten your honor by i don't know wearing promiscuous clothing out in town then it's best if she's put in place yeah violence is really a a a very very um a huge problem when we, we we Study trying to, to study those who study violence, uh, different kinds of violence, like collect, collective violence, interpersonal violence. Um, I don't think we have much time, but I, yeah. I just want to say that um, um, sometimes when I teach, I, um, I, I, I talk about an interesting letter uh, correspondence between Freud and Einstein in the 30s. Um, sometime, I think in 1933, I, I, Albert Einstein starts uh, writing uh, Sigmund Freud a series of letters. And, and he asks, he, he actually asks Freud, he says, look, I know this is your expertise, area of expertise. I want to ask you, how do you think would be the solution to violence, like human violence? Um, and, and Freud actually, he, he says, okay. And, and it's the beginning of the 30s and everybody's kind of understanding that there is something changing. Europe is becoming violent in, in various, you know, the kind of proto-fascist and Nazism is on the rise. And so it's a very, very good political question on how to prevent war, right? They knew the first, they, they actually saw the First World War and they're devastated, like thinking that something again can happen. So for them, the question of preventing war is really important in the early and mid-30s. And Floyd says to Einstein, he says, look, violence is, a, is this like very important and very, very basic, right? Human instinct, like people are, he doesn't use the word instinct, but he said like a, a primordial urge or, 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 or a, um, and Floyd is really interested, right? In, in, this, in the human um, psychology and the fact and, and the role of violence in human development, right? So he's, but he, he, but he tries to kind of, give Einstein this doubt. He says, look, but as humankind develops, they, people learn how to control their urges. And hopefully they will be able one day to reach a stage where they actually can control their violent, um, um, you know, their violent traits or, and, and I, and Floyd is trying to be optimistic. Now, of course we know what happens, right? We know that one of the most enlightened um, groups, like the Germans, basically create this very, very sophisticated, sophisticated system of genocide, which is like super violent, and and that's when I think the logic of the Enlightenment logic of you know when we are more educated and we know more, then we become less violent, really enters a, a crisis. This this huge crisis, the post Holocaust moment, where 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 this the sense of you know progress, enlightenment, and refinement, right, really reaches a, a, reaches a dead end. Now, these, are, of course, are kind of philosophical thoughts, but, I, but I, I urge, you know, I urge my students and I urge everyone to know these histories because the, we need to revisit these questions. 
They're never the same, never the same. And to think about the very, very complicated relations. Yes, I agree. Education from a young age and teaching children to solve conflicts uh, in other ways that are not violent, talking about alternatives for violence, talking about alternative to war alternatives, talking about peace, for example. These are important things. Um, and, you know, I think feminists sometimes... Uh, people talk about us as like witches or whatever, but I think that feminists have um, um, very, very kind of creative ways to think about old problems. Um, some of them are very provocative, but you know, I I really like my work and I like listening and I like to I like hearing and and um, learning about these topics from a more complicated perspective than what like the ordinary people would would think. Um, and, um, and yes, and I think that just studying in the university, humanities and social sciences is really, really important and fun. I have to say that I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and talking with us. And I, th I find it sometimes in certain fields and I think in gender studies and, and there's specific other fields where I feel like sometimes people are wary of kind of having these challenging conversations and discussions. And I think it's really, uh, commendable and admirable that you you know you you Engaged. you engage with people that maybe think differently than you and i think that that's really what academia is all about in the end of the day and so i really appreciate it and uh and coming from haifa yeah and coming from haifa the oh, most beautiful city in the Israel. worst city in the world <laughs> no. think, seriously <laughs> ah, <laughs> the yeah, traffic to, to here Tel Aviv, is just, yeah yeah <laughs> Um, but thank you thank you so much for coming where can people do, are you on social media how can people reach out yeah twitter and um, Sarai spelled S-A-R-A-I yes and an A and 555 because it's Hamsa 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 ah okay <laughs> um, and uh, you have papers in English and right and yes and publications people, yeah and you can write me an email if you're nice and perfect I can answer I like so the much. people who write us emails. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> All the hate mails. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you for, coming. for coming on. And bye, guys. Bye.